and to uh, Winky Zero. See there, a BJR, a research uh, fellow at uh, Yale Information Project, and uh, very fortunate to have uh, Wikimedia Foundation Council, Yana Linda, which is the pronouncing ever, and they'll be starting the presentation just now. Okay, so, hello everyone, uh, it's good to see you this afternoon. Uh, the way we're going to do this talk is I'm going to open with some uh, comments about the broader access to knowledge movement and what its goals are. And then Yana is going to speak a bit about uh, Wikipedia Zero and how it and Wikipedia more generally uh, fit with uh, the access to knowledge movement. So first you might ask, what is the access to knowledge movement? And, and broadly defined, it's a global movement with diverse constituencies. We're talking about remix artists and open source software advocates. We're talking about AIDS activists and subsistence farmers. And the thing that brings all these groups together uh, is a shared demand for more equitable access to the products and the processes of knowledge production. Uh, and these are demands that touch on issues of health, of education, of participation in culture, uh, and other rights that are uh, fundamental to human flourishing. Uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about three goals that the Access to Knowledge Movement shares. Uh, and those are access, participation, and uh, reform and, and other ways of building capacity for more knowledge and more participation. So turning first to the issue of access. Access here means that people can find and use the, the knowledge and the knowledge goods that they need. Sometimes this can be a, a matter of life and death. So consider situations where the knowledge is already out there but it's inaccessible because of IP and other barriers. You might look back to uh, the year 2000 when uh, a single year's worth of AIDS medication for one patient cost $10,000, far out of reach of pretty much anyone in poorer parts of the developing world. It was only after Doctors Without Borders and another, a number of other advocacy groups got together to demand uh, authorization to manufacture generic versions of these drugs that the price came down to affordable levels. The prices dropped from 95 to 99 percent once generics were authorized. So sometimes it means demanding access to things that have already been produced. Sometimes it means building new systems where access is already built into the production process. And you may be more familiar with things like Creative Commons licenses and Wikipedia-style production, where by virtue of the licenses used and uh, the way that the community produces the resource, they're already freely available as soon as they're created. The second thing I'd like to talk about is participation. So here you see uh, a handful of seeds. So this is a very old example. For millennia, farmers have been cultivating seeds, sharing seeds that work, uh, and using these to build a, a seed stock that serves the community's needs. Now today, you could just go to the market. You could buy seeds. You could even buy Monsanto's Roundup Ready GMO seeds. But you're making a trade-off when you do something like that. And to understand the trade-off, maybe it would help you with a more familiar context, like with encyclopedias. You could give everybody a copy of Encyclopedia Britannica, but that wouldn't be the same as giving people the tools to participate in the building and editing of Wikipedia. Why is it different? In some ways, there are some intrinsic differences in the end product. You might get a product that just has more material in the case of something like Wikipedia, because you have such a volume of labor that topics get covered that might not get covered in Britannica. You might also get higher quality work because you have more eyes, you have more diversity of perspectives. Uh, in the open source context, uh, Linus's law specifically says, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. This idea that having more people involved improves the product. And there's also a difference in the intrinsic value for the participants. By working on a knowledge product, you're building skills uh, you're heightening your social and your intellectual development in ways that if you're just given something uh, from elsewhere, you're not achieving that the same way. And on top of that, you're increasing the likelihood that whatever it is that you're producing is going to be relevant to your particular needs and your particular context, because after all, you had a, had a hand in shaping what it was. And the third thing I want to talk about is the HK movement's work to reform IP, but also to go beyond performing IP. As we'll see, it's only part of the picture, but to really understand H2K requires understanding a little bit about the traditional justifications for IP and the critiques that are often levied against those. So what's the point of intellectual property? Uh, here are three reasons that get put forth. One is the idea that giving people exclusive rights to reproduce and use their works in certain ways and the right to sell to 
others those rights gives people the right incentives to produce things. They, this is a sort of financial remuneration that is needed for creation. Uh, related to that, you might say that relying on market demand to determine what's good, what gets produced is going to lead to the things that people are the most in need of. And finally, you might say that this individual ownership ensures that people are going to use and exploit these resources in more efficient ways and give them to the people who need them the most. Each of these arguments has maybe something to it, but each of them also has some things lacking. So here we have a picture of Sir Isaac Newton, who once said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. If you're giving exclusive rights as the incentive to produce, you have a double-edged sword there, because at the same time, you're making it harder for follow-on production to come afterwards. Even if this is an incentive for many people, it has to be balanced carefully in terms of the exceptions, in terms of the duration, in terms of the rights given, or else you may have a loss in potential production that you might have seen with uh, looser restrictions. Beyond that, people create for all sorts of reasons, and open source projects, Wikipedia, uh, and, and other things like this have demonstrated that sometimes people create not for money, but uh, because of wanting to uh, gain recognition and respect from their fellow uh, collaborators because there's something that they're really passionate about and want to share with the world, uh, or because it's just something that they see a, a great need for and they want to provide for that need. And it's not always about the money, sometimes it is. In terms of market demand, there are some things that get skewed by a system that rewards inventors and creators based on how much people are willing to pay for those things. So the, the obvious example would be to go to some of the underfunded tropical diseases like Chagas or traditionally Ebola, which get neglected. And the people who suffer from the, these diseases typically don't have much money. So even if they're affecting millions of people, there's not a, a profit motive to fund that. But we can even just look at something closer to home, like antibiotic-resistant bacteria. The the, the best research model for approaching antibiotic-resistant bacteria would be to develop a lot of different antibiotics and to use them all very sparingly. There's not a lot of profit in developing a drug that not many people are going to use, so we don't see a lot of investment in new antibiotics, and we don't see any restraint. When one's developed, it gets pushed. The pharmaceutical company wants people to use it. They don't want it to become this, this uh, last resort weapon, which perhaps would be in the best interest of public health. And finally, on the issue of individual ownership versus commons. Often, oftentimes, people will talk about a need for individual ownership by reference to this idea of the tragedy of the commons that comes out in, in some of the old economics literature. That if you were to devote a field to public grazing so that anyone could put their cattle out on it, then soon it would just be completely ruined. Everyone would overuse it. And the right solution to this is just to give ownership of the field to one person. So that person can look out for its future value and, and assign efficiently who can come and graze and for how long. And maybe there's something to this in some context. It's not a great fit with uh, intellectual resources and knowledge resources, though, because you don't deplete a song or an invention uh, or an encyclopedia by using it. In fact, you might add value to it. it. It's a whole different economic model when you're dealing with knowledge goods versus something like a field. And at the same time, uh, so I, I've chosen this picture not just because we have cattle, but specifically because these are wildebeest, or GNU, uh, referencing the GNU operating system, which is one successful example of uh, a collaborative endeavor where even though you have multiple stakeholders, multiple owners, multiple people adding their, their views and, and thoughts on how a resource should be managed, they're actually managing it very successfully and leveraging it to uh, address a lot of need for that service. So those are some of the critiques that are levied against the traditional intellectual property justifications. But h is not all about critiques of intellectual property. It also uses IP in very creative ways, such as with free and open source licenses, creative commons licenses, other ways of harnessing IP in order to keep things in the commons to protect them from being uh, appropriated by actors who would uh, use them exclusively for their own ends, not for public facing ends. And sometimes it's about other laws entirely. If what we're looking for is to give more people access to knowledge and the ability to participate in making knowledge and having a say in their culture, then things like free speech versus censorship become important. Uh, things like privacy and, and neutrality become important. Things like uh, government transparency all become very important. And it's not even always about 
without cause. I think what we're trying to do is put more knowledge and more capacity in people's hands. Sometimes there are infrastructures that need to be built that have little to do with the law per se, but rather with putting money into schools or giving people things like uh, reliable and affordable internet access. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Yana to talk a bit about Wikipedia Zero. Yeah. 
goals. But it's really uh, rarely that we hear people in the media movement discuss um, uh, those ideas um, as an access to knowledge In the, in the access to knowledge framework. So how does Wikipedia accomplish these goals? So with respect to access, I think that's the most obvious illustration of, um, of uh, Wikipedia's accomplishment. Um, it, by providing organized uh, knowledge in 287 languages, it really provides anyone with um, access to internet to access to essentially the, the sum of all human knowledge, or at least something that aspires to, to be that way. Um, and uh, we now have millions of people accessing uh, Wikipedia every month. And what they're getting is not just any knowledge. They're getting um, a source of mutual knowledge. And the reason they get that is because it is decentralized. Um, in its cre the creation form is decentralized. And that brings me to the next uh, point, which is participation. And the way is, is is deeper than, than just access. Um, and uh, participation is really important because Wikipedia provides 70,000 uh, people per month with the ability to contribute to Wikipedia under free licenses. It, it shows an alternative production form uh, where many individuals can come together via the internet and curate the knowledge source. It essentially is at odds with the traditional IP justifications that BJ talked a little bit about, uh, which is uh, that uh, people are creating content without um, compensation. It undermines the idea that we need some sort of financial incentive or exclusivity um, in order for, for people to be creative. And then infrastructure. Um, that's almost the most important point because the infrastructure that Wikipedia is built on is really facilitating the access and participation that we're seeing. So that and, and that infrastructure can be described in five, as five different elements. The first one being the internet. Um, the second is wiki. Um, the third being knowledge commons. Fourth being decentralized control. And then there's the alternatives um, to IP uh, system. So the internet is perhaps the most obvious one. Um, people all over the world are able to collaborate together and share with everyone what they're able to create. Um, the wiki allows for what uh, Professor Yokai Beckler calls plan modernization, which is to divide portions of work uh, and work on, on, on those portions in parallel. It is very different from those things that we have on the internet, especially like blogs and websites, where people or firms are providing access, but they're not able to collaborate on the same sites. Um, it, it also provides for stored information that new people can come on and start building upon. Um, and discussion pages that enables people to talk, uh, um, to debate edits and share their resources and voice concerns if they have any concerns about the past edits. And then uh, very importantly, it provides for important meta information for people who want to do research on these edits. Um, and then the edit history, which provides for attribution and again, meta information about how a site is created. The knowledge commons is, is an interesting idea because it's not only what we have, it is, it is really um, everything that is used to create uh, Wikipedia and, and the other Wikimedia projects. It is books, articles, information that we find on the internet uh, that, that contributors can use to uh, contribute. And, uh, and then there is the, the knowledge that is already available on the Wikimedia project that can be used and reused um, to create more information. So an example would be images um, on comments that can be reused to, um, to illustrate new Wikipedia articles. Um, the fourth element is decentralized control. Um, and, and that is the uh, consensus-driven policies that we have on the projects that allow contributors to work on that, uh, to uh, agree on things like mutual point of view and what topics to cover and uh, to evaluate quality of articles and the sources that they use, and also to resolve disputes. Um, and then although there's no real hierarchy, there's the idea that um, some contributors have particular types of tools to be able to provide for decentralized control, um, you know, like the ability to block uh, these abusers. And all of that is really important infrastructure that we rely upon every day and we take for granted, but it really is important to provide for a knowledge source. And the, the final um, piece of the infrastructure is the alternative IP system. It's the free culture licenses and it's the reliance on the public domain. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the free culture licenses. Um, essentially, they allow contributors to make information accessible.
accessible and it's free of restrictions, and also to incentivize others to, others to reuse the content. It's what the Professor uh, Jonathan Zittrain calls the legal jujitsu on the copyright system. Essentially, allows for contractual arrangements um, that authors, whereby authors grant rights that are not normally available under copyright. Um, and on Wikipedia, we have only truly free licenses, so there's no restrictions except for the requirement that the information be shared alike and, uh, uh, and provided attribution. So notably, we have no non-commercial limitation um, so that um, the content that is contributed can be reused not only on Wikipedia, but also in apps, printouts, uh, things like Google Knowledge Graph, things, things of that nature. Um, so Wikipedia serves all of those goals, but so uh, Wikipedia Zero really amplifies that, uh, uh, all of these accomplishments uh, and, uh, and the access to knowledge goals. Um, mobile carriers uh, essentially have to agree not to charge users in the global south for accessing Wikipedia. And originally this was uh, only for Wikipedia, but it, it is now being extended to uh, most of the projects. And essentially, the idea is that users are getting access to the full Wikipedia experience in all languages, including images. And um, it operates under a set of principles to make sure that it's consistent with the Wikimedia values. So some of the principles include things like no exchange of payments, commitment to open source, and no exclusive rights or editorial control that carriers are getting as a result of the partnership. And it's really intended to increase access and participation of Wikipedia as a knowledge source. As a technical matter, carriers um, get a range of IP addresses that cover the Wikimedia projects to be able to see and rate them in their uh, billing systems, and uh, the Wikimedia Foundation gets a range of IP addresses to be able to serve up notices so that it, it is really transparent to users when they are uh, on free access and uh, when they're about to leave the, the free access zones. Um, and the purpose of this is to address the digital divide that we're seeing. So this describes the gap uh, between different populations have with access to technology, and specifically with respect to the internet. So what we're looking at here is how people uh, in the global north, which is North America, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand, are accessing the internet versus the, in versus the rest of the world, the global south. And uh, although we're seeing lots more people getting online, we keep seeing a consistent um, gap between uh, uh, the two geographic areas. And on Wikipedia, we see a similar gap. So um, although we are getting far more participation from the global south, it still is the fact that around uh, only, well, less than 30% of all contributors in um, uh, readers on Wikipedia are coming from the global south. So that is what um, Wikipedia Zero is meant to address. Um, and at this point, this is the map of where we currently have Wikipedia Zero. It is provided in 29 countries and approximately 30, uh, uh, sorry, 350 million each subscribers should have access to free Wikipedia, but they're not currently accessing it. Um, and the problem is that these are people who haven't used the internet before, so they just don't know what kind of knowledge source they all have access to. So this is sort of like a call to action um, to all of you guys, which is to uh, build awareness in the Global South so that the next generation of leaders and editors can come online um, and contribute and take part in, in the knowledge source. Um, and so we already do work with community members in developed countries. Uh, but I think we can all think about how we can extend access. So if you have ideas, please do come and uh, find the Wikipedia Zero team in the um, community village to discuss. Do you guys want to wait? <laughs> um, and uh, I think we're going to stop here, yeah, sure. unless we have time for questions. Yes, I was thinking we should take some questions. I'm sure everyone wants to ask some questions. Can I have questions from the floor? And uh, BJ and Yana will take them. Is uh, Wikipedia Zero content? Uh, Could you speak up so everyone can yeah, ask your question? The question is, uh, is uh, Wikipedia Zero content voluntary to do action or knowledge or volunteer? You're saying Wikipedia, does it need volunteers? Yeah. It totally does need volunteers. 
there's any questions, if you could have a chat to our speakers over at the desk over there. I'm <coughs> sure they'll gladly uh, answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
what are some other things, 10 things we can do other than blackout? And so we were doing a lot of this stuff uh, in, uh, with the BDDC. So, and, uh, so this appealed to me a lot. So I said, okay, one of our follow-ons for blackout is let's go brief Capitol Hill and let's have some, you know, very calm discussions with staff. And it's basic, and it's basically to listen to them and get feedback back from them, and see if we can uh, build some bridges and build some allies. So rather than fighting enemies, let's build allies. Uh, okay, so uh, who is it that did it? Well, here's here's some of our Wikimedia DC friends, Peter and Paul, and myself, when went to brief. So part of our process was we uh, we set up potential agendas and we had a consensus for our agenda. And um, my point of view was the agenda was mainly an excuse to go have some things to talk about while we listened to the Congress staff. You know, we're, to me the main thing was about listening. But, um, so we did a, had a consensus process for that and then we kind of published it internally and then we trained. So we did some training and we did some role play so that we were better at talking to the nice staff. Okay, so here's, uh, in the previous slide, we were actually on Capitol Hill in the building, but normally as Wikipedians, we like to hang out at the Library of Congress there in the middle, down the front, and then also at the Smithsonian and the National Archives, which are down in the middle, but up in the middle of the slide. Uh, but for this event, we were gonna be hanging out at the office buildings. We don't really go where the Congress people go. We hang out and talk into the real lobby where they where they have real lobbies and they have staff people waiting to you know, talk to people and answer people's questions. So that's where we went. Uh, now, as to what we were doing, here's here's a nice little street demonstration with, with the nice thing about redress of grievances. So the idea was, okay, uh, Blackout's part of our toolkit, but we can also do redress of grievances by just talking calmly about policy. So um, I think that gets me right into the agenda. So uh, this kind of gets in the weeds, but it's surprising. Nobody likes to talk about copyright uh, like Wikipedians, other than the people that write the law. So the staffers were into this, they love this. We, we could go into all kind of detail and they would be happy. So uh, normally, I like to have a, what is Wikipedia as a jump off to just kind of explain who we are and where we're coming from because there's a lot of uh, confusion. Uh, you know, it's a top five website, which are ad revenue and all this other stuff. So we have to explain the whole movement to the Congress people. It, it, after a while, they've kind of gotten that message, but um, it was slow going for a while. And then I also like to end up with a glam talk. Uh, I, Glam is a nice positive reinforcement, and we're working with other institutions, uh, so that that's a nice happy end note that we can talk about. And then now I'm going to go into more detail about the other ones. So, uh, computer fraud and abuse act reform. Uh, this has been uh, trickling around. Uh, Aaron's law is by um, Zoe Lofgren, and it's been a bill forever. However, recently. Uh, you know, a prosecutor tried to throw the 30 year book at somebody and the judge gave them community service. So the Justice Department has kind of figured out that no, this is not gonna work anymore, so they're open to reform. So we, we thought it was good to talk about this in, in general terms and say, you know, we need to have some misdemeanors in there, you know, so that we have a range of penalties depending on what the offense was. Um, okay. Um, the, my next takeaway that we briefed on was the Trans-Pacific Partnership Treaty. So this is more of a, a U.S. Pacific um, concern that we briefed on, but it's funny, the same thing's happening in your TTIP treaty. So what's happening is the people that gave us SOPA are kind of giving us these treaties. So in the treaty, there's, yeah, I'm sorry about the thing over the play, uh, but the, the, the the trick about these treaties is they have all these IP provisions that we probably we all as a community don't like. And so, uh, but they're also confidential, so we can only find them out through leaks and stuff. So, but however, there's a, uh, my takeaway was that there's a lot of pushback on these treaties from normal people. So that's good, and we should build more allies and push back on these treaties. Uh, the other takeaway is that 
the way that these the administrations tend to do these treaties is that they're going to keep briefing Congress until they have enough votes and then fast track them through within a week before we can do anything about it. So you know, we need to kind of keep building allies and expressing our concerns about these treaties. And that way, uh, at least in the US, uh, if it never comes up and it won't pass, then we'll be okay. Um, I also didn't really find out too, nobody cared too much about copyright alert system. This is the old six strikes and you're out, which uh, internet service providers have instituted now. So it is in force, and in the US we're not seeing any cases, so I guess it wasn't that important. Uh, Orphan Works Reform. We've been more active as a chapter working with the Library of Congress about Orphan Works. Now, Orphan Works means different things to different people, but for us uh, in the US, there's a whole body of work after 1923 that we don't know what the copyright status is. And so right now, there's kind of a big FUD strategy to threaten to sue you and stuff if you don't know. So our idea was to uh, support and give some feedback to the Library of Congress for some model legislation they prefer. They had done some model legislation in the past to have a clearinghouse, um, but it never got through. So again, we were just briefing on this topic to elevate the message. And then some other issues that came up that I guess is a movement we want to know. Uh, the House of Representatives is currently doing a sweeping reform from top to bottom of copyright law. So it's been a while, and this is an uh, this is going to take multiple years to do. But this this is um, and yeah, it didn't happen since the last extension. So people are looking forward to the next extension in a couple years, and they're worried that well, gosh, this is an excuse to stick the extension on uh, in. However, we didn't see any sign of anybody contemplating an extension. So we, uh, I think my takeaway there is that uh, the previous times they got extended is because nobody stood up to it and kind of gave them some negative feedback. And now that we're giving them negative, negative feedback about extensions, it, uh, it's probably not going to go through. Uh, also, uh, it's kind of a local US thing. So we, we have an ongoing controversy about the FCC, and they had a court case go against them so about net neutrality. Um, and so every, Congress is in a wait and see mode. They're not doing anything about it. They're also having hearings. So they had some hearings, though. And they had some hearings also about, when I say bellheads and netheads, what, I'm, what I mean is that back in the day, we had a monopoly telephone service that split up. And now we're watching people uh, combine back together again. So to me, this is this is ancient history. With we thought the we thought the netheads won, and now the bellheads are kind of having a robotist um, period. And uh, kind of to close on a somewhat um, bad note, but uh, I was struck by how bitter uh, IP the IP bar is about copyright enforcement. So that's how we get tarred with the brush of how we're paws behind the internet companies. There's a lot of um, negative uh, waves going on there. Also, um, so uh, to tell a story, I was, I was sitting in the Library of Congress, and we had the head librarian from Harvard, and the head librarian from University of Michigan at the Trust, and then the, the lawyer for the Authors Guild gets up and starts parading the Hackney Trust about how they're pirates and they had a hundred orphan works and half of them they could find a copy of the So it was, it was just, it, it was wild. So they, you know, because they're sitting in the same room. So, it, so, but that was striking is that there's a lot of lose-lose going on there. And it seems to me we're kind of, we can be part of the win-win solution and say, you know, let's have a clearinghouse and an expedited process or something so we have to go to federal court to solve these open court problems. So, again, I think that's the end for me, and uh, I look forward to your questions. So, any, anybody has a question? Thanks for the super. I mean, I'm not trying to make questions. I'll try and repeat. Is there any possibility of trying to get something like an access to knowledge agenda into the treaties like TDP and TP to well, really get people to talk about it, to say, yeah, 
don't make this just an IPR chapter, make right. it an IPR and access to the yeah, yeah. So the question is, what's, what's the possibility of getting um, open knowledge agendas into these treaty negotiations? And, you know, you know, your guess is as good as mine. My impression is that a lot of the, the treaty negotiations are seen as trade treaties. So they go through departments of commerce, and so it's very corporate oriented. You know, so we're kind of fighting a culture battle there. Um, I, th I think we can win it. It's just that we're not, you know, we're not organized like a corporation to, to seek the same venues through trade treaties. So um, it's, it's a problem, yeah. Are the people on the Hill, are, do, do people on the Hill exist who are receptive to that point of view? You, uh, yes, are there people on the Hill receptive to open knowledge? Yeah. Uh, trying to yes, it's a handful, and there's not. I don't think there's a coalition. I don't think they're organized. So, yeah. <coughs> um, again, we could we could try to work something with. Uh, there's open knowledge people, and we could maybe you know build some allies there and do some joint lobbying. That might be a way to to um, do that agenda. But yeah, not not organized as yet. Yeah, so I, I guess I have two very related questions. Uh, I'm curious, practically, like how you engage in lobbying or influencing legislation, like, like what tools do you use to change the law? And as a follow-up, what tools do you wish you had? Like what, what would you have in an ideal world? Well, uh, as you saw, we were very limited. So it's basically emailing, making an appointment, and then face-to-face -face chat, and then giving them pieces of paper. So um, we kind of don't really hack the political process because we're not using social media. Uh, we're just using the old channels to, to help move the agenda along, uh, which is kind of a slow, go, small ball kind of strategy. But, you know, um, what, yes, if we had more, uh, more ongoing contact to your Congressional district, that would be a way to organize. You know, if we could get Wikipedians together and say send an annual email, or, you know, they respond well to email for some reason. You know, they're a little, you know, they're late adopters, so, you know, but uh, they, and they tend to be very responsive if you're in their district. So if you're a potential voter in, your, in their district, and there's, there's all the software that'll automatically show you the right district. Topic. So we haven't done really email drives yet, but that might be a kind of maintenance thing we could do for the larger group. Yep. Are you maybe targeting the legislative branch or also the government itself? Okay. Yeah. Uh, are we talking targeting legislative or government? Um, uh, executive branch, right? Uh, I should have said we were, were we tend to target. The IP subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee. So there's 500 people on the Hill. See, the legislation came from the Hill. It wasn't an executive action. Okay, so we're mainly um, we were mainly concerned about the legislative branch, and then we even targeted that down because a lot of action comes through the committees, and and the SOPA came through the through the IP subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee. So we went to all those people. Uh, and made appointments with the ones that would see us, and so that that's where the interest came from because they all they all know the code for copyright. They actually let me eat out of copyright law, which is a big, you know, it's hard to find people like that. So it's you know, it's a, it makes for a nice conversation. Yeah, is there a, a electronic petition facility? I think you use it. Um, yeah, that gets to some of the email that goes around with petitions, and no, we, we weren't really into the mass side of things. We were kind of trying to do a small conversational tone. Any other questions? Was it um, uh, with the result? Did you reach something? Uh, well, again, we, we just have connections that we made. We don't have specific uh, items that they've changed folks on or anything. So again, it, as usual on the Hill, nothing happens until like the last minute and then it all of a sudden blows up. So the, the idea here was to kind of do some some uh, preliminary, you know, ounce of cure or, you know, 
not a pattern here, but an absolute prevention. And so kind of just, just to build some bridges to start a dialogue. Uh, because again, even the pro sofa Congress people understand that SOFA's not gonna happen. Even then they're still for it. So the idea is let's build some allies with the anti sofa people and then explain our community and what, what the positive benefits our community brings and how they can help us. And, and again, a lot of it's less legislation than just culture. Okay, one final question. Okay. Um, when you talk to the uh, Congress, uh, congressmen or their staff, what are the kind of arguments that um, they find more persuasive? Ah, uh, well, it, it depends. Again, a lot of the staff and the Congress people tend to be about the interests of their district. So if you have a Congress person from Las Vegas, they tend to be pro SOPA because a lot of those companies there are movie studios. So again, you kind of can't persuade them there against their own interests or their own campaign contributions, but we can talk about other issues, um, say the, you know, that again, that, that wouldn't help us on the treaty, but we could talk about Computer Fraud Act that, you know, before. So again, we, that's why we had a multiple issues, so that we could just have a conversation about many things. Again, there, there, it wasn't about mind changing, really. It was just about listening and, and finding out where their concerns were. That is excellent. Um, uh, Jim has been very patient with me. Uh, it's an excellent talk. I think we should all thank you. Thank you.
which um, hurt us a lot. So um, all of these things were happening practically every single year, and it really made us feel like we're losers. I mean, it, it really gave us a terrible feelings. So we were, we, we really felt the need to, that we have to do something about it. So um, what do you do when you have the need to, to do something about it? You basically do a meeting and you gather in Brussels you with uh, interested people. So we came together and um, we had to be clear before we started our advocacy and lobbying process, what is it that we really want to achieve? I mean, what, what, what are our goals? What are our policy goals? And then, of course, I mean, most of you know, but still to, to take it from the top, we are a movement who want to gather the sound of human knowledge. We do so by gathering uh, content under mainly Creative Commons licenses and putting them on our online-based projects. And um, that uh, means that Creative Commons is the very central tool for us. And now, if we put these two statements together, we want to gather the sound of human knowledge and to have it free, and we use Creative Commons licenses, that for me, the only logical conclusion is that we want our final goal is for Creative Commons to disappear, to dissolve, to not exist anymore. Not because we don't love Creative Commons, we really, really like them. Uh, they also have really cool caps. No, but because we, we would really imagine that one day Creative Commons would replace the current copyright framework. Um, of course, um, this is not going to happen anytime soon, and um, there is no need to even like push for that now because it's really such a long way road ahead. So um, it, it would be a waste of energy to, to go for that thing. So we, we realized we need to be a bit more realistic about what we want to achieve. I mean, we need to be to to get the things that are actually achievable. So um, we talked about this, and we were looking um, for for the consensual topics. So we came up with um, a list of um, three policy goals, which are universal freedom of panorama in Europe, everything, all government works like in the US should be in the public domain, and orphan works should be usable on our projects. Um, we picked um, this short list of three, um, three policy priorities based on um, that we believe there is a consensus and a movement on that. We were very passionate about them. They have direct impact on our, on our projects, and they're in line with our long-term strategy. And last but not least, we believe that they're the most feasible, something that is actually achievable over the next few years. So um, it was also like things that are easy to explain to the public and to politicians. I mean, it's, it's you can actually go to somebody and tell them, look, we're not allowed to take pictures of our public spaces. I mean, this is um, a big problem when it comes to freedom of speech on the internet. And um, you can go to the uh, French government and tell them, look, um, we can't really take your pictures of your own president. And instead of this, we have to go to the American government and cut your president out of the picture. <laughs>
few really, really terrible things happened then. So in the 90s, what happened is um, we had the last copyright term extensions from life plus 50 to life plus 70 years. And in the EU, that happened in 1993. Um, the Delors Commission, back then the commissioner was a German liberal for the internal market. And well, Disney's copyright was running out, so somebody proposed, hey, let's extend copyright by another 20 years. Uh, the European Commission commissioned a study on, on the effects of a copyright term extension, and the results of that study were that it is a third. Um, the Commission was not happy with that study, so they commissioned a second study, which basically said that it is a terrible idea. So the Commission commissioned a third study, which also said that it is a terrible idea for European enterprises to extend copyright term. What happened is that copyright terms got extended anyway. Um, I want to make a bold statement here that this is not possible anymore. See, back then, in 93, nobody really knew what's going on in Brussels. Nowadays, we have, and I see all of us, part of the digital civil society. So we're following what's going on. And if there are three, three studies that say copyright term extension are a bad idea, then we're there to cry foul. Um, and I think this is a major new element that developed in the last, um, well, it, it really blew off with ACTA, but I mean, it developed over the last 20 years. So um, again, we, we should not forget, let's be real, it's not like we're the powerful people now in, in the world and everybody's afraid of us. No, we are still the underdog, but um, that, has, um, that, that does have some value because we're really the, the small little cute guys that really everybody wants to talk to. So you know, people are really open to us and you know, they accept us and they, they want to hear what we're doing. Um, so, um, Back to, to what we are doing, we now had our goals and now we had to figure out what do, what do we do with them. Um, so first thing we have to do when you want to change the world is you get a mascot, that is Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy is a weasel and the chief Wikimedia lobbyist in the EU. Um, and the second thing you have to do when you want to change the world is have another meeting, of course. Um, so we had another meeting, but this time we didn't really look for our policy goals, for our, for our priorities. We already had those set. Now we have to come up with a strategy and tools. How can we create the tools in order to be able to lobby in the future on those three goals that we already had set as a common consensus? So we were thinking really hard about you know, how this can be done. And since we were in Brussels, and Brussels is sort of um, a great place, and um, we came up with the concept of liquid lobby. Um, <laughs> not only because um, convincing somebody is most effective when drinking beer, but actually the term is taken from another term called liquid democracy, which basically says that um, you shouldn't have um, a rigid structure between a, somebody who represents you and the direct participation, but you should have both, and both elements should be um, at each and every time um, for, uh, playing with, like um, communicating to each other and, and interacting together. So we came up with an idea that of course, Wikimedia is this massive community that where everybody is going to be, to be doing their part and, and you know, saying stuff and uh, working on an issue or on another. But we can't go around the fact that we need some people, a small group of people at least, that is permanently occupied with this so they can follow the process and they have the information when necessary. So we want to have at the same time some a little group of people that, that is preoccupied with this and whose job it is, but at the same time remain open for everybody to be able to join in on any issue they are interested in. Um, in order to really do this, we need to create tools that really lower the threshold called for users, for community members to participate in the democratic and advocacy and lobbying process, in the liquid lobbying process. So um, this will be the challenge in the next, for me, in the next uh, more or less 12 months to really come up with these tools. Um, we made some first attempts. Um, we created and we're starting now at um, this conference and adopt your MEP campaign. So we made a list of only related elected MEPs that sit in positions that are important to copyright reform. Um, we have their nationalities, their con contact addresses, and we would like Wikimedians and Wikipedians from their constituents, from their country to to say, okay, I'm taking him or her over and I'm going to be dealing with, with him or her over the next five years. And you get the arguments, you get the know-how, you get everything you need to know from us, but you contact your own politician. It's, it's really much more powerful than just somebody in the center to, to try to talk to everybody. Um, then we're still, of course, working on a strategy because if you're a decentralized global movement, the 
biggest risk in an advocacy is uh, having a fuzzy message, not knowing what to do um, and what you're fighting for. So everybody's going to be doing stuff throughout the world in the name of Wikimedia. That means that when we take a position on a certain issue, we need to be clear on our strategy and have the argumentation already lined up and agreed upon. Because otherwise, we're having a fuzzy message, and then you can forget about doing policy. The policy people are just going to be abusing. So we're currently working on that, and you're all more than happy to, to, to pitch in, honestly. Um, then it's the third thing. We're using um, our chapter structure, which is a very powerful tool, to, to get in touch with decision makers. For instance, the, one of the um, chairs of one of the important committees in the European Parliament is from the Czech Republic. Instead of talking to, trying to get a hold of him directly, I asked Wikimedia Czech Republic to write to him in their own language as, a, as an organization from its own country and to ask him for a meeting. It works wonders when, when organizations from your own, own country write to you and from your own constituency. We have the chapters, we have the structures, let's use them. I mean, this is where we are powerful and we have the advantage over other people. Um, and then, just to not let you in some abstract things, to, to, to tell you what's going on currently in the EU, that's a picture of the parliament in Strasbourg, which of course we can't use because there is no green open around France. Um, <laughs> funny thing is the parliament actually gave us, gave us a written document that we are allowed to use a picture of their parliament, and then we had to tell them that they're not allowed to give us that permission because they don't own the rights as the architect owns the rights and the parliament doesn't have the rights to its own building. So <laughs> chapters, individual Wikimedians, and the Wikimedia Foundation answered. Um, this was a first step of us really doing something together and, you know, sort of coordinated. We didn't all um, type in the same answers, but our answers were uh, compatible. So, you know, we were all going in the same direction, although we didn't have the exact same set of answers. Um, then we have a new uh, commissioner, president of the European Commission, who was elected and it was a massive surprise. Um, his number one priority, this guy, John Claude Juncker from Luxembourg, said that um, he wants a copyright reform as a number one priority in the next five years in the EU, um, which um, basically should um, just at least open the doors to, to talk. Um, the problem is within the Commission, there is a fight in between several units which way to go. So we believe that this is after the consultation and before the Commission releases a white paper in September, a white paper is a document that prepares a future legislation. Um, time has come for us to try and draft and to release our first position paper. So we're currently working on a position paper on copyright, which basically should be sent to the Commission saying, okay, here's what we want. And um, we've been talking to chapters, and the first chapters have already um, agreed to participate in this. But um, this is still a meta, so please comment and edit. It's not too late uh, to work on that together. Um, and um, well, again, please join join me and uh, join us in, in our effort. And um, well, if if you really now have the urge to do something and to really help out, this is what you should do after the break. Participate in the panel discussion on how should we media advocate for free knowledge. Here at Wikimedia, you can find me in the chapters village, usually standing next to a whiteboard. Um, tonight we have a Net Politics Beer in London and the Shakespeare Pub, which is about 10 minutes away from here at 8 o'clock. A Net Politics Beer is an informal, informal meetup of people who like to discuss internet politics, and we've invited some external organizations like the Open Rights Group, the Internet Society UK, and uh, Creative Commons UK to also join us for that. And after Wikimania, well, if you want to stay up uh, to date, uh, follow the other obviously by the mailing list and, well, drop by our um, meta page. Um, that's about it. Um, thank you, and if you have questions, I have my three answers. Deutschland, um, which covers me 
need for about 30 hours a week.
more effect uh, in the US. Um, what time? Um, how did it look? You, you think it will? <laughs> there was a great talk on that yesterday. <laughs> um, is, do you mean um, financially or how um, European law affects servers in the US? Yeah, or? So, so if the architect wanted a picture taken down, could they not just go to the US? Uh, Wikipedia would say, hey, we still have, it's still copyrighted in the US. Uh, um, in, in the case for freedom of panorama, it's really that um, the national law states that if you're standing on a public street, <laughs> you're allowed to take that image. So it's really geography based where the picture was taken, not where it was published. Um, so we, we really also have the issues that, I mean, if we solve them within the EU, we are more than sure that we would be able to use it um, on, on the server. What do you expect some results related to freedom of panorama? So you have to explain your targets. What do you think we can see some kind of progress? Mm -hmm. um, I expect the copy a copyright reform proposal of some kind um, to enter into the European Parliament let's say in two years. Um, it's a wild guess, but that's my expectation. Um, my job is now in Brussels to make the topic important enough so people deal with it and know about it and to include it in the reform proposal. Um, we had recently the outgoing commissioner for, for, um, digital, for the digital agenda, it's called, um, actually um, used our atomium example in one of her speeches. Where was the Yeah, I can't find it now, this one. So she actually used it in one of her speeches, which um, gave us a massive headway. So now we have um, one of the general directors fighting for our issue, and um, another one, the one for internal market, being rather skeptical uh, about it. So I mean, the, the, the first problem is really getting the topic on the, on the table. Um, in the agenda, and I believe we are making good progress there so far. Looks like one final question. Uh, do you know which idea you guys mind when he's talking about uh, your copyright thing? Because he must have any idea what's wrong with the old one. Yes, um, he is criticizing more or less exactly the situation that we're criticizing. Where was the map? So this is freedom of panorama, but it's actually for any exception, the map in Europe looks like this. Like 28 completely different legislations and any, any combination of a list of 20 possible exceptions. And also the fact that a YouTube video may be accessible in, in, in the UK but not in Germany. If you're talking about a single market, that's unacceptable. Um, and this is exactly what he's criticizing. He wants to remove, um, his exact statement was remove national silos in copyright legislation, which means for me it can only mean a harmonized um, Unified copyright legislation for the entire European Union. But and you didn't give a hint whether he's harmonizing towards Greek or red. Towards? Towards Greek or red on that map. Well, that's our job now. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, to be honest, that's exactly our job. Because it could go, first you're fighting for um, a certain dossier to be reopened, and then you're fighting for your things to go in. Yes. Please. Yeah. Um, so just, just picking up on that point, um, you talk about three things that you want to go in. Is there anything that we should be worried about in terms of things which are going in the other direction? Well, the thing that we're worried about is um, the Information Society Directive, the um, Copyright Term Extension for Music, uh, the Orphan Rights Directive, and the Collective Rights Management Directive. Um, and well, if, yeah, we're expecting in the next year, so what we're going to have? We're going to have the telecoms package, we're going to have a um, copyright directive, we're going to have a new audiovisual media directive, and we're probably going to finalize the, um, um, the general data protection regulation. So, if we're talking general net politics here, we are having four to five massive dossiers coming, coming along in the next five years, so it, it would be good to be prepared for that. Well, that's an excellent uh, topic. Can we take this?